and Audacity in three, two, one. Hi guys, and welcome back to the Barbell Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Lynn, and I'm here with my co-host, Marissa Roy. And in today's episode, we're here with a good friend of ours, Lacey Dunn. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking all about thyroid and hormone health. So we are super, super excited to have you on. So thank you so much for coming. No, oh, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be talking with you guys today and be connected with you. You guys are two very smart, amazing women. So I'm honored to be with you. Oh, thank you. I'm she flattered. <laughs> well, Lacey, you and I have a pretty, I feel like a thorough history. So I think I started following you back in 2014 or 2015, back when, um, I guess when I was kind of affiliated with the PE science. And so I started with you then, and I finally met you in 2016. We went to Vegas for the Olympia. So that was a long time ago. <laughs> like I'm old now, but yes, yeah. <laughs> back in the bodybuilding world. And yes. I know we are all now, we have evolved since then, but yeah. I'm so glad we're still connected. I know me too. So I think the other, I think I, and the, I saw you compete in nationals in Miami too that year. That was 2016, right? Yes. Yes, it was. And that was back yeah. before shit hit the fan and I became hypothyroid. <laughs> yeah. So I do want to dive into your background, but I guess kind of to introduce you to our audience, you have so many letters after your name. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a registered dietitian, a uh, certified personal trainer, and you are the CEO of Uplit uplift fit nutrition. You have a team of dietitians that work for you. And again, like you mentioned, former bikini competitor, you are a functional medicine dietitian with a focus on hormones, thyroid, gut health, and metabolism. You are a podcast host. You have your own podcast. Uh, you are currently, or I guess a brand new author of the woman's guide to yeah. hormonal harmony. So super excited. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Let's see what else you basically your mission is to reclaim health hormones and have women become the masters of their own bodies. So uh, I guess the other important thing to point out too, is you are a fur mama. <laughs> Was it two cats, right? And one dog? Yes. I used to be a cat lady for those that, those that don't know. And then I adopted a three-legged dog named Gabe, AK Gaberson. And he has changed me into a cat and dog person. I uh, relate to you quite a bit on that. <laughs> I know. I love seeing your animals. Yes, the zoo. But is there anything I, that I left out with your intro? I'm a fellow Jesus lover. So all about God. And that's about it. I'm a nerd. <laughs> and awesome I love fan. chatting anything, <laughs> nutrition or hormones or gut health. And if you throw it at me, we could talk about it. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your story and kind of how you got into this space and kind of what led you down this, down this path. Of course I'll make it brief. Cause I hate talking about myself. It's terrible, mm -hmm. but okay. So when I was getting my master's degree back in 2017, now I feel old, but back in 2017, I was doing my master's degree, doing my dietetic internship for those that know, don't know, it's basically an unpaid job. So I was doing that as well as doing full-time online training. And I was burning my candle at both ends. So I was feeling pretty crappy, but I was just going through the motions. I was just trying to get it done. Didn't have an option. And I started, I, we were learning about iodine and zinc and all the micronutrients in one of my master's classes. And it pinpointed to a little bit of the thyroid health. And what I like to do when I learn is I like to dig deeper. So I went ahead and I grabbed a few books, specifically Aviva Rahm's thyroid, Adrenal Thyroid Revolution. And I started reading that to try and like put all the puzzle pieces together with my classes. And I was like, hmm, as I was reading this, I was like, weight gain. Okay. I'm a very tiny person. I've gained 10 pounds out of the blue. Have that hair loss. My hair's falling out. My eyebrow hair's falling out. Brain fog, significant. Always cold all the time. Digestive issues. A little bit of constipation. You name it. So I was having a lot of these different symptoms. Heart, heart palpitations, another one. And I was like, this sounds like me. 
<laughs> and my hypothyroid. And I had asked my doctor to pull my thyroid labs and he just pulled a TSH and a T4. And based on what I'd learned and what I'd researched, I was like, this is not a full thyroid panel. This is not giving me the full answers. And so I went in, did my own blood work. I went to Ulta labs, went to Quest, which sent me to Quest labs and I did a full thyroid panel. So I checked it all myself and boom, I was hypothyroid. And I was like, this is why I'm feeling like crap. So it was really amazing to see, you know, all my, all the connections with all my schooling and all my research and then being able to pinpoint it myself. And then after that, of course, I had to dig into the whys. So then with my learning and my researching, I knew right away what it was. I was stressed as hell because what does stress do? It downregulates your thyroid hormone, your metabolism. It stops you com from converting T4 to T3. So you're inactive to your active thyroid hormone. So I was having all that plus in combination of overtraining and obviously not fueling my body enough for the training, which was further downregulating my HPA axis, further causing me to feel like crap. And of course, further suppress my thyroid and my sex hormones and my overall metabolism. So unfortunately I did do it to myself. And there's a couple other factors that I really truly believe played a big role in the longer I was hypothyroid, I mean, I fixed my quote unquote, fixed myself, got on medication, was able to wean down the medication, was able to get my thyroid levels back to normal, then more things happened. So there's more to the story, but overall I kept digging, kept looking for more and more answers. And then I found um, the past year, I found that I had mold toxicity. I had a cavitation, a jaw cavitation, which is essentially dead bone within your jaw from my previ previous wisdom tooth cavitation. And then I also found candida, H. pylori, SIBO, leaky gut. So I found all of these things and I wouldn't have found all that if it wasn't for the first bit of finding my own hypothyroidism. Wow. And I feel like it's kind of tough because as a bodybuilder and going through prep, you're like, oh, well, I'm always cold or, oh, you know, this is, this is normal. pretty normal, right? Mm -hmm. It's normal. And then you think about it, you're like, actually like losing my hair, being cold all the time. Those are not that's not normal, especially if I'm not in prep anymore. Yeah. And it was really confusing for me because back then I started gaining weight out of the blue and I was a tiny person, right? Train hard. I, to be honest, I looked freaking fantastic back then. Like <laughs> I, I look at those pictures. I'm like, damn, um, <laughs> but it was easy for me to train. I was able to train hard and I literally could barely get through a 30 minute workout and I was like, what is going on? I'm bloated. My body is so watery. I look like I've gained like so much weight, but I haven't changed my food intake at all. I haven't done anything different. And so it was really validating to see the why. And yet it was like, oh, I did it to myself. But anyways. <laughs> Yeah. And I think the other thing to point out too, is you went to the doctor and you're like, here are my symptoms. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll run your hormone panel, but they really don't run a full panel. They just kind of do right. basics. And I was listening, I can't remember what podcast I was listening to, but they were talking about that doctors, when they're viewing blood work, they come at it from a very different kind of perspective. And like, they might look at things and being like, oh yeah, you're, you're fine because you're not in this range of something that you could be diagnosed with, mm -hmm. but it's like, yeah, I might be fine, but I want to be optimal. And so it's like, so let me know how I can do better to have a better blood panel. And I always say you deserve to not just survive. You deserve to thrive. And if you aren't feeling like your very best self, do not let anybody gaslight you, including medical gaslight you and just say, oh, you need to go exercise and lose weight or, oh, you just need to eat more. Or, you just need to calm down. You just need to go to therapy. Like screw that. No, you're feeling bad for a reason and continue to dig because you deserve it. You deserve to be treated the way that you treat others and you deserve to feel like your very best self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, you, sorry. Go. No, go for it, Marissa. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, like that happens so often. And so I have clients like pretty, not frequently, but, um, in the past, maybe six months or so I've had clients go get labs because I'm like, look, uh, something's not right here. You know, either you're not losing weight or you're gaining weight at, you know, something where you really should be. And like, let's go get something done. And for me, who's not an expert in this. And I think one thing that I really want to stress throughout the entirety of this episode is, is staying within your scope of practice, because I, I know we have a lot of practitioners personal trainers, coaches, online coaches that really do, you know, 
coach a lot of people and they want to help as much as possible, but that doesn't mean that we can step outside of our scopes and just try to interpret labs. And so for me as a coach, it's like, okay, I want you to go get labs. I want it to be a full panel, but like I don't necessarily know exactly what that looks like. So I'm going to try to search and try to figure out what that is for you. Uh, but, you know, we're going to have to go with maybe our best guess here because I haven't gotten a degree in that topic. And then on top of that, I'm also not going to be able to interpret it. So whatever your doctor tells you is kind of what I have to run with unless I outsource. And then like, that's a whole nother step and a whole nother level. So it's like, we have all of these hurdles and hoops that we have to jump through. Uh, but just, it just emphasizes the importance of having someone in your corner who it is a specialist and does understand these things. Uh, because, so I think this is, this is just going to be a super valuable episode, not only for our listener, but for me as a coach, I'm just like, tell me what I need to be telling them to look for how do we you know and then when do I need to outsource and those are all questions that I think will come later in this conversation um but I did want to I don't know Christina if you're going to take it in a different direction but I think just getting a better background knowledge on like the thyroid and like what exactly yeah. all, all these things are before we dive really <laughs> deep yeah I agree I love it. And I greatly respect you for doing that because a lot of different coaches do not do that. They read the labs and they think, oh, I'm just helping them. No, you're doing your, your client a disservice. So let's talk about what the thyroid is. Yes. So the thyroid is a butterfly shaped gland found at the base of our neck. And it essentially is the powerhouse of our metabolism. So just like the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, your thyroid is the powerhouse of your overall metas, your metabolism. So you need thyroid hormone to do every single process in your body. So if you have abnormal thyroid levels in your blood, that can actually greatly influence almost every single cell in your body. And it can contribute to further hormonal, adrenal, or gut imbalances leads down to, you know, everything under the sun from, you know, mood, cognition, metabolism, hormones, heart rate, growth and repair. Your thyroid is what can decide if you are feeling optimal, feeling off, if you're losing weight, you have energy, if you're fatigued or you're feeling fantastic. And of course, if you feel depressed or anxious. So you need an optimal thyroid in order to have an optimal health and well-being. And when it comes down to our thyroid, it's, it can be quite complex, but I like to think of the thyroid as like a thermostat in our body. So with our thyroid hormone, we create T4 and T3. That's what we make. So T4 is our inactive form of our thyroid hormone. T3 is our active form of our thyroid hormone. Our thyroid produces that and produces largely T4. So that's inactive. That's important to remember. About 80 to 90% is inactive. Then sometimes 15 to 20%, it really depends on the person, is T3, so the active form. So for your listeners, active thyroid, T3, that's the gas. That's the gas doing the job. So you have to have T3. So we make T4, T3. We have to get T4 to T3 in order to get that gas to do the job. Even more so, we have other additional hormones that play a big role with our thyroid health. So our hypothalamus, which is our brain, secretes what's called TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. This speaks to our pituitary that releases TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. That is our thermostat marker. And this is an issue when it comes down to conventional doctors, conventional labs, because they, they draw TSH. That TSH is telling our thyroid to upregulate or downregulate activity. So typically what happens is when your thermostat, your pituitary reads low T4 or T3, it's going to creep up TSH. So it's telling us, okay, let's pump up the volume. Let's get more air conditioning in this place. Or when we have high T4, T3, then TSH drops down saying it's, you know, it's hot enough. We don't need any extra air. So what happens is a lot of doctors rely on that TSH and this is not their fault. It is what is taught in their endocrine journals. I've looked into it. It's really annoying that it is a guideline for them to follow, but that's the way that it is. They were taught to look at TSH as a marker of thyroid function because of how it should work, how the thermostat should read. However, it's not always the case. So the pituitary responds to the T4 and T3. However, it doesn't always sense what's going on. There can be fluctuations that cause abnormalities in how the pituitary and the hypothalamus are reading the thermostat. So we make that T4, that T3, 
and that converts in different cells. So our gut and our liver, um, 20% in our liver, uh, 10% in our gut, the rest in the, all of the other tissues. But what's important to know and recognize is one, TSH is only a pituitary marker. And two, we have to convert our T4 to T3 in order for it to be active and to do the job. Now there's other things that matter. So it's not just how you create your thyroid hormone. It's also how you absorb that thyroid hormone. And we can dive into more things like what halts conversion, what halts creation. But what also matters is getting the thyroid into the cell. So when we talk about hypothyroidism, and feel free to stop me at any time because I rant and ramble, but there are, <laughs> there are three main types of hypothyroidism. So for your listeners, hypothyroidism is when you have low thyroid. So low T4, low T3. Hyperthyroidism is when you have too much. So high T4, high T3. Well, we can also have, of course, what's called subclinical hypothyroidism. And this is actually in two to 7% of the population. And this is when we have a normal TSH, a normal T4, but maybe a low end range T3. And this is not ever caught if somebody does not check one free T3 or free T4 levels, but also does not check their, they just check TSH. There's a variety of other things that can happen, but we have hypothyroidism with one primary hypothyroidism. So that's destruction of the thyroid gland itself. Two, we have our secondary hypothyroidism that is damage to the either the brain, the hypothalamus or the pituitary or some organ or tissue that's impacting the thyroid. And then three, we have that subclinical. So there's nothing wrong with your thyroid, but the thyroid is not responding somewhere because of either a brain or pituitary connection or, pituit um, or a conversion or cellular issue with converting T4 to T3 or absorbing that T3 into the cell. Um, and the cellular hypothyroidism is what I had in combination with the under eating. So with cellular hypothyroidism, what happens is your thyroid hormone can look completely normal in the blood. Your free T4, your free T3, that's something I skipped over, but your free T4 and your free T3 can look normal in the blood and your TSH can look normal. So your doctors can be like, oh yeah, she looks great, but why is she having hypothyroid symptoms? That is because you have either inflammation or high or low cortisol preventing that thyroid hormone from getting into the cell. If it can't get into the bloodstream, if it can't then get into the cell, it can't do the job. Lacey, so correct me if I'm wrong, but is there, there's a difference between free and available too, correct. right? Correct. That, and that's what I skipped over. So T4 and T3, if you're just looking at total levels, that's bound to thyroid binding globulin. If it's bound, it's not free and available. So that's why you have to make sure you check free T3, free T3 and free T4. It's kind of like a boot on a car. It's if the boots on the car, if the thyroid binding globulin is on the thyroid hormone, it's not going to get to where it needs to be and can't do the job. So what can happen is if you have estrogen dominance that increases thyroid binding globulin, that's dropping down your free levels of thyroid hormone that are able to do the job. So that's the importance of the full thyroid panel. Right. And the other thing I think that I had a misconception when it came to, oh, let me get blood work. Let me get, you know, my levels run. So I just thought, oh, you, you get your blood drawn, but you can actually get your panels run. And I don't know which, what you can get done, what type of test, but you can also do saliva tests as well. So I don't know if that has anything to do with your thyroid. And I know that also that the time of day that you get your, you know, panels run, uh, if you've had any food or water or anything like that, but actually the time of your, uh, menstrual cycle, a lot of those things can affect your levels too. So if you get your panels run and everything looks normal, it doesn't mean that they're normal. It just happened to be at that exact moment that you had your test done. Yeah, you always want to do blood for the thyroid. Saliva, okay. you could do things like cortisol, sometimes sex mm -hmm. hormones. I would prefer doing blood or urine. Mm -hmm. But yes, thyroid, always doing the blood. And it's very fascinating. I love that you mentioned the menstrual cycle because this is like up and coming. And I know uh, Dr. Carrie Jones was just talking about this. When you ovulate, you have a spike in your thyroid hormone. You have a spike in your progesterone levels, which increases your metabolic rate. And that can make your levels look higher than they normally are. So it's really interesting to see that and kind of like showing us maybe to check our thyroid hormone in the later half, maybe like week four or the beginning week one. Um, and it's very fascinating. TSH changes on a day basis. So it mm. ranges up and down as well as a yearly basis. So it can change based on the seasons. So it's very fascinating and even more so the importance to not rely on that TSH because it does fluctuate so much. 
Wow. And I think that we already have such a barrier to getting blood work done, not only getting your doctor to approve it, going through insurance. And like you mentioned, most of us having to to fight to have them done and then having to go outside and do an independent lab. And if you do an independent lab, I feel like they're a lot more flexible. And sometimes they even send kits to your house and you can do everything kind of in-house, which is really cool. And I'm sure we'll touch on that. But if you go the traditional route and you go through your doctor's office, like more than likely you're going to have to find a time and date that works best for them, that they can accommodate you. So it's not like you can choose which day, which time of your month that you're going to be ovulating or, or, you know, what part of your menstrual cycle. So I think it's, it's just interesting. Like it's not just, Oh, okay, let me do this, 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 and do it all the optimal. It's just whatever they can fit you in with. And the downside too, is when it comes down to that, they, they don't pull the free T3. They don't pull the free T4. They don't look at antibodies, which is super important because those antibodies, the thyroid globulin antibodies and the TPO. So the thyroid peroxidase antibodies distinguish between hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. So when we're looking at Hashimoto's, that's the autoimmune form of hypothyroidism. Basically, your body says, okay, there's some internal or external stressor in my life. And what it does is it reacts and attacks the thyroid gland. It thinks it's some foreign invader. Those antibodies distinguish that. So if you don't check the antibodies, what can happen is your thyroid labs might look great. Your TSH might look great. But then over time, as those antibodies are high, your thyroid continues to be destructed. Your thyroid then of course is not able to work correctly. It is not able to produce the T4, T3. And over time that drops down, that drops down to finally it's so low, you need thyroid medication your whole entire life. So Mm -hmm. that is super important because some people don't know that that changes throughout your life too. Just because you pull antibodies one time doesn't mean the next year you have not developed Hashimoto's. It can happen out of the blue by some trigger. So it's super important to check those antibodies. And a lot of doctors skip over that. They really do. Or they'll check one. They'll check TPO and they won't te- check thyroid globulin antibody. You have to check them all. So this is actually really funny that we're talking about this because I've gotten my labs done probably maybe twice since I like maybe in the past four years. So like every other year. And honestly, like that's on me. But the first time that I actually went on my own, like as an adult to go get my labs done. I sit down and I was like, yeah, like I just wanted to get like a full blood panel and just like, you know, check on everything and just make sure everything's okay. And my doctor literally looked at me and laughed because I was like, nothing was necessarily wrong with me either, but like I was about to, uh, get off of a hormonal contraceptive method. And I was like, oh, I want to see what this looks like. And personally, that's, uh, my research interest for my master's degree right now that I'm in the middle of. And so I was like, just super into all the the literature on it. I was like, I just want to see, like, I'm just like super curious. So like, let me take a look at my labs. Right. And so I had this big list of like everything I wanted to get tested. And she was literally laughing at me. Like, why do you want this? Like, this makes no sense. Like you're fine. You're healthy. You said nothing's wrong. And I'm like, uh, okay. And then the sick, close to the same thing happened. I went to a different doctor. Cause I was like, I don't feel like getting laughed at again. Um, but this time around, it was a couple of months ago. And I just was, again, nothing was necessarily wrong, but I think it's good to just get regular labs. So I had my list of like general things that I wanted to get. And like, she was also like, okay, so there's no reason like, that's okay. Like, and she was a, a little bit more respectful about it, but I could tell she was super thrown off by the fact that like, I was just healthy and getting my labs done. But, um, and then there was like the whole sheet where like all the different things that she could order. And I, she was, she, I mean, even like as a medical professional didn't tell me like, these are the ones that you should get. If you're looking for this, I was literally pointing at the sheet and going that one, that one, that one, that one, please. <laughs> you know so- what the disgusting thing is? What? They are legal- they are put in their guidelines that they don't have to and shouldn't check antibodies unless TSH is above five. Mm. Basically until the, the thyroid is finally destructed, we don't have to check which is disgusting. And I'm so sorry that happened with other labs for you too. Yeah. Which I feel like it's like, okay, you might have a car and it looks like it's running fine, but that doesn't mean that you should, you know, shouldn't pop the hood open and take a look and see what's going on on the inside. Right. 
Yeah. There might so, be a little bit of, um, you know, it might be making a slight noise, but let's not check and see what's going on under the hood, right? <laughs> Wait till it explodes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think with all of these different kinds of like these subtypes of hypothyroidism, this is something that I wasn't aware of at all. I thought it was just hypothyroidism. That's, you know, just one thing, right? And then th- th- there's all these different subtypes. So that's super interesting. And I think, um, let's, let's get into what does that look like in terms of hypothyroidism and maybe the differences in symptomology between hypo hyper, and you mentioned Hashimoto's maybe distinguishing those three things for us. So when you think hypothyroidism, it doesn't matter if it's Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism for the most part, you're going to have the same symptoms. So you're going to have potentially the weight gain, the hair loss, the fatigue, loss of eyebrow hair. Um, You're going to have constipation, sometimes diarrhea. A lot of times people, when they have Hashimoto's, they have a goiter. So that's because the thyroid gland is enlarging. It's being attacked. So it's enlarging. However, that's not always the case. You don't always have a goiter. So those are the main things. Um, Heart palpitations are another thing. Um, Dry skin, acne, those are all things that can happen. When it comes down to hyperthyroidism, the biggest ones are, oh, of course, anxiety, depression will happen in both. But with hyperthyroidism, you're looking at weight loss, diarrhea, very bad anxiety, depression. You're looking at... um, overall really high temperature and heart rate. So those are the main things that I think of hyper versus hypo. However, it's not always the case. And I see a lot of the symptoms swing back and forth, especially if somebody has Hashimoto's and autoimmune disease, because they will go back and forth between being hypo and hyper as their thyroid gland Mm -hmm. gets destructed because it releases a lot of thyroid hormone when it gets destructed and then it backs back down. So you'll have, if you have Hashimoto's swings and symptoms in both. Man, that's tough to differentiate if you're experiencing both symptoms. Yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun. So we, we've kind of talked about blood panels and we keep saying, oh, run a full panel or run this, run that. What would you suggest someone to run if they wanted to check under the hood and see what was going on? So the most important thing, of course, is to check your free T4 and your free T3 also checking your TPO and TGAB antibodies. And then of course, you're gonna check a TSH even though that doesn't really mean anything. Um, So those would be the top ones. You can also check reverse T3. So reverse T3 is kind of like the brakes in the car. T3 is the gas, reverse T3 is the brakes. It competes with T3. So if you're making, you convert T4 to T3, And then, of course, what can happen is if you don't have enough nutrients, maybe it's selenium or zinc or iron or B vitamins, folate, or if you have excess stress, what can happen is you, instead of going from T4 to T3, you go to reverse T3, and then guess what? That competes in the binding site, and it's not able to do the job. So you you can check that. And then, of course, I always suggest doing a full nutrient panel as well, and if you can, a hormone panel as well, because if you have high estrogen levels, that could be causing you to have that hypothyroidism. So checking things like estradiol, progesterone, free testosterone, that will sex hormone binding globulin. Those will all be great. And then nutrients, big thing. I like checking things like zinc, vitamin A, copper, all your B vitamins. A lot of people skip out on those, but all your B vitamins, because you need all of them to make your thyroid hormone checking zinc, selenium, things that you need to convert T4 to T3. Um, And of course, doing a full iron panel, not just iron, because that's not all that matters. Ferritin, your storage form of iron, your transferrin, your total iron binding capacity, doing a full iron panel, super important. And then of course, a lot of people forget vitamin D and magnesium. So we really want to check these two and the balance of it, because if you don't have adequate magnesium, you'll never be able to bring your vitamin D up. And vitamin D deficiency, I think is one of the biggest super common. deficiencies in the world. Yeah. 50 to 60% of the population. And it doesn't matter if you get in the sun. Unfortunately, it can cause anything. Yeah, man, this is going to be an episode I need to listen back to like two or three times. <laughs> I know I'm There's like so much information. I'm like taking some notes and then I'm like, mm, but I'm just going to play it back and take yeah. more notes <laughs> later. Yeah, uh, I love yeah. it. You guys just buy my book. It'll help you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely have that in the description for all of our listeners too. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so then 
with that full panel, obviously we discussed the feasibility of it for some people, which can be harder, especially if like, I don't know, you, maybe you have some symptoms, but you don't feel mm-hmm. totally off or like, you know, maybe like you said with your story. And I think we are the types of people who really relate to that. Um, I personally just went through a really tough season of just working a lot and not having a lot of balance in that aspect, uh, going through the motions and, you know, kind of doing it to ourselves. Right. Yeah. Like yeah, you said. Good. Yeah. And so I think a lot of our listeners probably relate to that too, because like attracts like, and um, you know, when it comes to, you know, with, maybe you have some of the symptoms or, but maybe you're just white knuckling through it, right? Like maybe you're just feeling okay, kind of tired. And like, maybe it's still a good idea to get these things checked out. That's not like the best rationale to bring up to your doctor because like to a doctor, it's like they're treating clinical diseases and they want to see some big red flag in order to warrant these tests. So we've touched on the, the feasibility of getting all of these blood tests that we want done. But let's say, okay, let's say we can do it. Let's say we we get through that step and jump through that hurdle and we get to the point where we get the labs back. Now, where do you take that from here? What are the specialists that are able to interpret these blood results? And what do we do moving forward if we see certain types of things? So you want to have a licensed medical provider on board, whether that is an endocrinologist, an MD, a dietitian, um, or even if you're having a naturopath, all people that can help out. I always say, and I do require all my clients, even if you're working with a dietitian, you need a medical doctor on board too. Like a dietitian does not replace a medical doctor. <laughs> I know some of my clients like, and I feel bad saying this, but sometimes they, they treat me like a doctor and I'm like, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> so you need a doctor always on board. And a naturopath is a great alternative as well. They are a quote unquote, doctor, a naturopathic doctor. Some people don't agree. I think they are doctors. So always have a doctor on board. Um, what your labs look like, tell you what your next step is because you've got to get to the root cause. Really the, the thyroid, unless you are, unless it is actual, like your thyroid is damaged and it's not because of, you know, hypothyroidism. I mean, you can't fix that. If your thyroid is damaged because of like chemotherapy or radiotherapy or maybe some shape or form of some toxin that damaged it, cancer, you can't fix that. But for the most part, just like having hormonal imbalances, having hypothyroidism is a red flag saying there's something going on in your body. So it's the fire alarm going on in your home, aka your body, saying there's a root cause of all this. And we got to then question, why is my thyroid the way that it is? And we dig and we ask, okay, what do we need to look at? Mm-hmm. So Lacey, what about coaches who maybe don't have a doctor or a dietitian or someone like that on their team? Are there a lot of people who will do consultations for blood work? I'm sure you do calls like that. Oh yeah. I do them all the time. Um, I know other, other people do them as well. There are mm-hmm. actually like, I, and I've looked into it. There are some fantastic, pretty cheap alternatives to having a doctor now that you don't even need insurance to use. I know um, SteadyMD, Parsley Health, these are great to do. And even um, there's some either, there's other websites, I believe that you could just get like a a one-off doctor. I know I've sent my clients to a one-off endocrinologist that they just speak to online that you're able to get either a referral to somebody else or able to analyze your blood work. And I know even Ulta labs, because they tried to hire me, they, um, they actually have MDs and RDs on staff and you can actually do a consultation for like, I think $25 for like 15 minutes to go over your blood work. Yeah. So it's not like having some help is you, you don't have to look at everything yourself. You can hire somebody even cheaply. Yeah. That's really good to know. Let's bring that barrier to entry down and let people get in the door. And I just slipped into and connected with Vibrant Wellness, who I absolutely love. And I kid you not, you guys, they are the cheapest I've ever seen blood work, ever. Really? Like you can get an entire nutrient panel, entire thyroid, sex hormone binding again, sex hormone binding again, like everything that you could think of for well under $215. It is incredible. All right. We'll make note of that for sure. And I think the other thing too is, um, 
you know, when, when we're talking about referring out, that doesn't necessarily mean dropping your health and fitness goals. Like we can work in conjunction and that's what right. having a team is all about. And I've, I had one client who, uh, I had her pre and postpartum and she had her whole team of, you know, medical professionals, a pelvic health physio, and she had me in her corner too, for exercise and nutrition advice. And she, uh, you know, she always said, you know, I guess this is what they mean by like, it takes a village, but like it does, it really does. And we want to have that full team available and you want to have people you trust in your corner. So really build up that team as an individual. If you're listening to this, you know, have the different people in your life that can collaborate with each other and then Love collaborate that. with you on what is going to be best for you. Cause I think what you relate to us about is it's really about the client and the client centered approach. And as long as we're doing what's best for them, you know, there's, there's no rivalry between me and the RD. We each stay within our own scope and we move forward together. And you help each other. I mean, the more minds, the more that they can help. So I love that. Absolutely. And just because you have hypothyroidism doesn't mean that you don't need to be working out. Yes. You just have to work out in what way is going to be best for you based on your root cause. So root causes of hypothyroidism, we don't want to skip over, right? Mm -hmm. So nutrition deficiencies, we talked about things like selenium, zinc, iron, vitamin D, B vitamins, um, magnesium, also nutrient excess. Too much zinc can induce a copper deficiency. Too much iodine can cause you to have Hashimoto's. Too much B6, that will cause an issue with paraphernalia peripheral neuropathy. I think that's how I say it. Um, endocrine disruptors, environmental toxins, anything going on in your gut. So SIBO, candida, H. pylori, overgrowth, parasites, food intolerances, leaky gut. Um, we talked about hormones. So having estrogen dominance, that will induce hypothyroidism. Some medications can as well. So I know a lot of people, they take medications for like anxiety. Sometimes that can cause issues or, um, Allergy meds, another one. So allergy meds deplete your stomach acid that can further stop you from digesting and absorbing your nutrients, leading down to overgrowth. And then if you take in anything like Flonase, like those glucocorticoids that you spray up or prednisone, that can induce secondary adrenal insufficiency. So then that will cause you um, hypothyroid issues. And then of course, we're looking at anything genetically sometimes, like a genetic trigger or maybe like MTHFR or a slow comp gene that predispose you to maybe hypothyroidism. Um, we talked about under eating, over exercising, over stressing things that I did to myself that can cause hypothyroidism. And then shockingly pregnancy as well. So a lot of women don't know this, but when you're pregnant, you can actually get that genetic trigger to develop hypothyroidism. So that's another thing that can cause it. Lovely. <laughs> I know it's like, Oh, giving life to the world, but giving away your life at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's something that you pointed out too that I like is I think sometimes we have a tendency to kind of just put band-aids on a lot of the symptoms that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so and I feel like it's like a water bucket and you have all these holes poked through it and you're just trying to duct tape it and put it all together, but trying to find the root cause is like, okay, well, what's poking holes in our bucket or like it's what typically can we multiple. Do to stop that? Yeah. So I think it's important to, it's, it's not just, okay, well, I'm def deficient in this. So let me just slap this on. And it's like, well, let's figure out why this is happening. Yeah. Let's figure out why you're deficient. Is it because mm -hmm. your diet sucks? Is it because you're not absorbing your nutrients? Mm -hmm. You have to question that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, super important. I think too, when we're talking about like, okay, well, what's poking the holes and like, there are multiple holes. I think, especially when you make that list of all of the things that can cause hypothyroidism um, or Hashimoto's that might, you know, scare our listener, right? Like, oh shit, I took an allergy <laughs> med yesterday. What does that mean for me? Do I have, you know, whatever. And so like, what we don't want is for the listener to hear this episode and be like, wow, this is a bunch of cool information, but now I feel like I have this disease or now I'm in a self-diagnose, right? Like we don't want people to walk away with that conclusion. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> yeah. So what I think is kind of good to touch on is a lot of times, like you said, it's a cumulative effect of increased stress from all of these different things, right? So it's not just the fact that you take an anxiety medication. It's the fact that there's that plus five or 10 other things that are putting your body in this negative overall, like, you know, stressed state, because like, what are, what 
do all of these things have in common? It's inducing stress on the body to right. some extent. Right. And so it's the stress bucket. Yes. It's the stress bucket. And so like when we really, yeah, when we really take a look at it as a bigger picture, I really want to emphasize like, and this is something that Christina and I talk about on our duo episodes all the time. It's just, it's, it's a, really a battle of overall stress management. There are obviously clinical and genetic underpinnings to this too. So not gaslighting it whatsoever, but if you can take control of your own personal stress management to the best of your ability when that comes to healthy lifestyle, just general stress management practices, sleep, like that can iron out a lot of risk, I think. Yes. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's like one way to kind of quell the fear that might be bubbling up in some of our listeners right now. <laughs> Yeah, I do not want you guys freaking out. There's so many things that can cause hypothyroidism, but keep in mind, a lot of the symptoms of hypothyroidism can also be symptoms of other disease states, like adrenal insufficiency or even high cortisol, um, hormonal imbalances, poor sleep. So there's yeah. a lot of things that can happen. Viral, I mean, viral infections, like there's so many things, but just know if you do not feel good, just keep digging. I mean, the more the look, the more you look, the more you find, the more you know, the more you can fix. So but don't miss the force for the trees. <laughs> yes. And also yeah. don't, don't try to diagnose something. If you feel on top of the world, I feel like yeah. there's much more rare circumstances where someone feels great, but then they're like hearing all these things are like, well, I was tired yesterday, so I mm -hmm. must have this. And <laughs> that's what we don't want to happen. <laughs> yeah. Always yeah. look at, um, I like to say, always look at your diet, your lifestyle, your stress, your environment, your relationships. Look at all these factors first while assessing blood work, but look at all those things before you jump into any diagnosis. I know like I've been there, you guys, like I felt like crap before with my hypothyroidism. I've been like, oh my God, when did I get bitten by a tick? I have Lyme disease. What's going on? I'm dying. Don't freak out. Look at everything, fix everything first. Yes. Yeah. So I think to what you were saying, it's like, when you, when you went back to, you're like, oh, I've always been a thin person. I started gaining weight. And so you're like, oh, weight gain, that's a symptom. But for someone who's like, well, I've gained weight. It's like, well, are you tracking your diet? Are you tracking your nutrition? Are you making sure that everything is the same? Cause you, you were a bodybuilder. So you were like, I know I'm tracking. I know that my intake has stayed the same. I know that's like something is not right in that sense. So it's like, okay, well make sure you're, you're tracking things, make sure you're tracking. Like, I know that some people, um, like headache blogs. So like, when are you experiencing a headache? Like what time, what was maybe the onset with there Was there a trigger? So trying to do like a symptom log, something like that, because I feel like also too, the more information and the more specifics you have to present to a doctor yeah. that can also help too. I know allergies will make you feel hypothyroid, hypothyroid. I mean, they can make stuffy nose, sinus congestion, headaches, extreme fatigue, brain fog. It could simply be the trees trying to kill you. And it could be seasonal <laughs> allergies you're dealing with. Of course, seasonal mm -hmm. allergies don't cause hair loss, but if they're stressing you out majorly, they might cause hair loss because hair loss can be stress induced. So, yeah. And I think too, with our current society, and I think we've gotten away from it a tiny bit. I don't know if it has anything to do with the pandemic, but I feel like before it was like grind, 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 like no sleep, no days off, no this, no that. And I feel like we've gotten a little bit more um, gentle maybe with ourselves. Like it's okay to take days off. It's okay. Like if you need to focus on yourself, take a mental health day. So I think that's really good too. Cause it gets away from like, Oh, I probably shouldn't sleep because I need to finish this by this deadline, mm -hmm. or it doesn't matter that I'm feeling stressed out. I need to be there for other people. So I think that that's really good too. That's in my book. I put um, my rules for how to fix your thyroid. And one of them is self-care and slothing. So <laughs> stress is not nice to your thyroid, but slothing is. So making sure that you have good stress reduction and self-care strategies is super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, coming from a counselor background, I love that. So, <laughs> yes. So, I have a question for Lacey. And that is so, I have had clients who have in the past had diagnosed hypothyroidism. And, but, but basically, kind of, I don't know if this is a band aid or not. So, this is totally just me being curious, like not leading the question in one way or the other. But um, they have medications for it, they're on that medication. So, they say, everything is normal because I'm on that medication. What is 
the fuller picture to that. What does that mean? And like, what are the implications of being on a thyroid medication? Does that fix the issue? How do we, you know, is that a long-term solution? Where do we go with that? Unless your thyroid is damaged, you don't necessarily need thyroid hormone. So unless your pituitary is not speaking to your thyroid to produce thyroid hormone or your brain is not speaking your pituitary to speak to your thyroid. So for some people, they get put on thyroid medication when they don't really need it. They needed to fix the root cause, the under eating, the chronic stress, um, the toxins, whatever. So getting that thyroid medication, it, it is a bandaid. It essentially is. You're getting what you didn't have because of some root cause. Does that make it bad or wrong? I don't believe so. I mean, it is band-aiding it, but at the same time, it's helping the person to actually be able to survive and thrive during that period of time. But continuing to dig and find out why, I truly believe is important. Because Mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they fix the why, they can reduce the thyroid medication and sometimes even come off and they don't even need it. And then that's less on stress on your body, less medications you have to pay for. Um, Doesn't make it wrong, but I like to say, if your body doesn't need the thyroid hormone, maybe try and figure out why you're taking it in the first place. Yeah. I think that's super important because like I said, like I've had clients who come to me and they come to me for exercise and nutrition. So like, what are we doing? Most of the time, probably fixing part of the root cause is a healthy lifestyle. Right. So then seeing where we go with that. So that's really good information for me to have. Yeah. And a lot of people get scared. It's like, I don't need this thyroid medication. Am I going to get a bunch of weight? It's like, well, if your thyroid's working correctly, what it should do is just upregulate its activity. Yeah. So TSH yeah. will spike at first and then T4 and T3 will pump out and then boom, guess what? Your thyroid making is making its own hormone. Yeah. There is some walks of thought that taking a thyroid medication long-term can cause your thyroid to suppress its own activity to where you potentially might have to stay on it your whole life. There's not enough long-term data to say that's true. So- mm-hmm. I know a lot of people like they think that's, that's what can happen, but we don't know enough to say that's true yet. Yeah. And I think the same line of thought kind of goes with hormonal contraceptives too, where, right. because that's what that does is you take the pill and then your exogenous hormone spikes and then your endogenous hormones, uh, hormone production is suppressed. And then, you know, what people are are afraid that if they go off of that, they're not going to make their hormone uh, after the fact. But I think um, kind of going back to healthy lifestyle, you know, if we're doing all the things that we need to do, putting our bodies in a healthy place, feeding our bodies well, um, I feel like more often than not, we have a, a totally regular outcome rather than something, you know, right. kind of kind of scary. Right. But um, kind of interesting how those two things are, are similar in, in those lines of thought. Yeah. It's just, you're not, your ovaries aren't going to just like shrill, shrivel up and die. And neither is your thyroid. <laughs> They're working. They just have to get to that connection again, the brain to ovary connection, the brain to pituitary to thyroid connection. They got to quote unquote, wake back up. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So what do you think we can do to help our, I mean, we kind of touched on this with, with a lot of things, but if you had to make a list of things that we can do to help our thyroid health as a, let's say as in the scope of practice of me or Christina, as Mm -hmm. a personal trainer, what can we help our clients do or our listeners do uh, that's within our scope of practice to help our thyroid health and optimize that thyroid? I love that because there's so much that you can do stress less, focus on self-care, making sure people have good mindset work on themselves. Because that's one of the biggest, hardest things, not only to induce hypothyroidism, but cause sex adrenal imbalances and of course, gut issues. So stress less, focus on a wide variety of nutrients, stay away from things that you are intolerant to, or you're sensitive to make sure you have, you know, adequate micronutrients. And you're not just throwing a bandaid, a micronutrient, like little vitamin or taking your greens powders and thinking you're safe. No, wide variety of plants and veggies and fruits and don't, don't decrease something unless you have to. Endocrine disruptors. This is huge, not just for your thyroid, but your overall, your gut and your hormones. And that's anything that you put on your body. That's skincare, that's hair products, things that you clean with sprays, fragrances, what you cook with switch to cleaner, safer products. Be careful. Cause a lot of 
companies will greenwash. So they make it look clean and all frou-frou and cool and they spike the price up and it's not really any safer for you, but cleaner, safer products. Um, and then when it comes down to sleep, one of the most important things you can do for your overall life, please block blue light before you go to bed. That will disrupt your circadian rhythms, disrupt your hormones, disrupt your thyroid, stop you from producing melatonin, which helps you to fall and stay asleep, helps in your immune system, as well as, of course, your metabolism. So sleep, super important. Make sure you're getting at least eight hours a night. Um, I know a lot of people struggle with sleep issues, and that's a whole another topic of conversation, <laughs> but make sure you're getting adequate sleep. Um Feeding your gut, we talked about fiber, wide variety of plants. I would limit the amount of artificial sweeteners. Not all are bad. Do not get me wrong. I have my fresca on a nightly basis because it is my vice. But just don't pound down all the sugar-free syrups and all the equal and all the Splenda. Keep it to a minimum. Make sure what you're eating is mostly whole, unprocessed foods. Um, make sure that if you have anything... Like, ah, this is kind of like out there, but like anything that's not supposed to be in your body, like breast implants or maybe like teeth fillings, amalgam, mercury fillings, make sure you check those because those can cause your thyroid to be terrible. And then so we talked about self-care, but um, oh yeah, relationships and trauma. So this is huge. Make sure that if you have anything that's underlying within you, maybe that's a person that you don't like or that makes your life worse, or you have traumas that you've never gotten to over time, those can cause hypothyroidism. So please make sure that you have a good therapist on board, a counselor, and you're working through your struggles. That way those are not holding you back from being your best self. Yes. I love that last one because it's like, I have these conversations with clients all the time. We're like going through diet, we're going through exercise and we hit these speed bumps. We hit these roadblocks and we're like, okay, well, you know, how do we, how do we get more consistent? And it's like, we keep digging and we keep digging. It's like, something's not right here. And it has nothing to do with your macros and it has nothing to do with your cardio or your exercise. It has to do with everything that's right here um, or everything that's right here. And your I just pointed, pointed at my brain and my heart for anyone who's listening and they and connect. Have, yes. <laughs> and so it's, it, it all happens there. Right. And so we have like all of these things that are holding us back either mentally or, you know, with, with just self-limiting beliefs, or like you said, relationships, things that we haven't addressed out in the open, um, uh, that, that can really just impact our, our levels of stress overall. Self-negative image mm -hmm. being your worst enemy that can and will stop you from feeling like your very best self. And if you have a victim mindset and think, woe is me, like all these things are going wrong in my life, that in itself will make you feel like crap and your body senses that. It will increase inflammation. And what does inflammation do? It wreaks havoc on your entire body. So trying to stay positive and love yourself and love your body and look at the grateful parts of your life and the things that are going good for you are super important. And I could dive into like, I really truly believe um, spirituality is another part of our day-to-day -day life and should be and should be a part of our our health and happiness and well-being. However, I know some people aren't that way, but I truly believe that's another aspect of our health as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Marissa and I, we talk about mindset all the time because again, we really want to emphasize to our listeners that you know it's it's important to have this growth mindset, that yeah. not having this fix like, well, this is just the way I am, or this is just how I feel, this is just my life. That no, you are in control. So if something doesn't feel right to like make sure that you are heard in those sense or do things that can help you rather than hurt you. Like you still are in this position of power where you can try to help yourself as best you can. I love that so much. Yeah. So I think we, we got a little bit on this and I don't want to go too, too deep because I don't want to keep you here for another hour and a half, but, <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of stuff. And I think when we go into practical applications in this industry, we've obviously touched on pra practical applications for your life, you know, listening to, you know, just your body, your signals, taking care of yourself inside and out. Um, I think the individual applications are there. Now let's kind of zoom out. I want to look at just the industry because there's a lot of talk about all of these topics going on with all the gurus and a lot of 
I feel like there is a lot of conflicting information and there's a lot of stuff that's tossed one way or the other. And I want to get your take on just what are the gimmicks? What is the BS that we need to look out for in this industry? Because we've talked about hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, gut health. We've talked about all these things. So what are the band-aids? What is the BS? What are the things that people now that they're aware of these issues might be susceptible to falling into? Typically the band-aids are anything that is covering up the symptom. So you're looking at anything and everything from sometimes medications to supplements to diet changes, like the low FODMAP diet. That's a band-aid to, um, chronic bloating, gas, dysbiosis, candida, parasites. So anything that anybody just throws at you without asking why would be a Band-Aid. And then any short-term fix or quote unquote, like single protocol you need to get your period back would be something to watch out for. Mm -hmm. There's no one root protocol to feel like your very best self. There, ne there never is. There's no one period protocol. There's no one PCOS diet. There's no one type of PCOS. There's no one Hashimoto's diet. So really step back and remember that you are an in a unique individualized person and you deserve to be treated that way. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, that's right on brand with everything that I say in every single episode. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll catch you up on this. We just have a joke because um, Christina, like pretty much every, every time we talk about a specific topic, um, she goes like, we'll go on a ramble. I'll go on a ramble. She'll go on a ramble. We'll, you know, connect the dots. And then, you know, by the time we get like halfway through towards the end of the episode, you know, she's saying something along the lines of, you just have to find out what works best for you. And <laughs> there was one point where like, I I think she said it maybe like a couple times in one episode and I just got on her ass for it. <laughs> so, so now the joke is, I love that you always have to find what works best for you, but it, it's very yeah. true. <laughs> I feel like mine is it depends. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That's a good one too. For sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like whenever you do Q and A's on Instagram, when someone's like, what do I need to do to do this, this, this? And your answer is like, well, it depends. <laughs> I'm always like scratching my face. Like it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I know I start every answer with that, but you know, I think the useful part is, is we're able to say, okay, well, what does it depend on? You know? And I think it, it's, it's kind of a cop out to just say it depends, but you know, we're always able to at least point someone in the right direction with that. Yeah. And what I want, what I want to point out too, is like it, when it, you're looking at your health, it doesn't just depend on where you're at now. It depends on where you were at previously, your past. As much as that's not where you are now, that's influenced who you are and how your body is. So mm -hmm. you've got to look at every single aspect of your health. And that's why I love functional medicine because you're really looking at the person, the holistic view of everything that's happened to them. It's what's going on in their internal and external environments. And you're focusing on the root cause approach. So- that's mm -hmm. who I am. That's what I love. I love that you guys are all about the person too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's really good. I mean, I think we could be here for another two, three hours and we'll probably sure we'll have you on for another topic because this was just so, so useful and so helpful. And I know that I'm probably going to have to go back and listen to this at least two or three times, just to <laughs> wrap my head around everything. But uh, we've had some practical applications, but Lacey, we, we ask all of our podcast interviewees, uh, like, what do you feel like is your best advice to give to a listener to give to someone for them to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle? And this could be in context of everything we talked about or completely out of context. I would say the best thing that you could do is have a support system people that are going to encourage you and love you and support you uh, because that makes a big difference with how you also see yourself and how you treat yourself. So I truly believe that you need some type of support system and then you have to focus in on self-care. If you are burning your candle at both ends, if you are pouring out into others but not pouring back into yourself, your cup is going to be empty and so is your health and so is your happiness. So surround yourself with people that love you and treat yourself just like you would treat somebody else that loves you. I love, I love it. That. Yeah. That good. <laughs> so Lacey, is there anything else that, I mean, obviously there are other topics that we did not touch on, but is there anything relevant to the discussion that we did have that you think we skipped over or any final takeaway points or something that you want to add on to our discussion? 
I would say I have worked with so many women at this point to where 85% of thyroid issues are stemming from the gut and that is stemming from chronic stress, but also from things like H. pylori and candida and parasites and SIBO. I would say if your gut does not feel good, that is the first thing that you can fix to look into if you suspect or you have thyroid issues. So I just want to pinpoint that because it's such a big issue and such a big trend. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, that's expensive. I don't want to go do like a GI map or I don't want to go do a SIBO test. Now, don't get me wrong. You don't have to do that if if you've not first looked at how you eat or what you eat, but if you struggle with issues and you struggle for a long period of time, look at your gut because many times that's where the root cause is coming from. Yeah, love it. Because your your gut is your opportunity into your system, right? It's 80% of your immune system is in your gut and your gut's like a door. You want the good guys to come in and the bad guys to stay out. But mm-hmm. if you have that chronic stress, you have inflammatory foods, you have um, food intolerances, environmental toxins, all that stuff that's coming into your bloodstream, causing inflammation, leading to the hypothyroidism. So I would say just make sure that you are prioritizing a healthy gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And that might lead us into another episode in the future. <laughs> yes. I know. It's like, I want to dive into like prebiotics and probiotics and artificial sweeteners and all that stuff, but yeah, we'll get well, nerdy can- again. We can definitely have you on again. (laughs) To be continued. Yes. So Lacey, where can our listeners find you? What resources do you have? Any uh, books that you have available? (laughs) Oh no. What book are you talking about? There's only (laughs) one. The book (laughs) Guide to Hormonal Harmony on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, apparently Walmart. Apparently Amazon today, they saw that some book company like bought it and started selling it for cheaper. So they like drop down the price without telling me, I guess. They're like, I'm like, okay, cool guys. Anyways, you can get it on Amazon apparently for $27 now. Um, mm. Find me on Instagram at faith and fit. To be honest, it's just me sharing free information and posting weird photos of my cats and my dogs. And then I'm also a Twitter, Twitter girl. So if you like to tweet, catch me on Twitter at Lacey A. Dunn. That's about it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Lacey, so much for being on. This was such a good episode. And I know that our listeners will find this useful for sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you guys so much for having me on. And you guys, to the listeners, these are two great humans. Stay here. Keep listening to them. Trust them. They have my stamp of approval. Oh, thank Thank you. you (laughs) Well, we hope that you guys enjoyed this episode as much as we did. And if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. You can find both of us on Instagram You can find me at Christy Lynn Fit and Marissa is at Marissa Roy Fitness. Thank you guys so much for listening and we hope to see you back next week.